Hi. Good evening, everyone. We are live, and this is the third installment of our pre-conference roundtables. So just a reminder that SC Red, we are having a conference April 18th through the 21st of April 2024. So you have a year to clear your schedules. <laughs> it's going to be amazing, but we just wanted to kind of lay a good foundation for some of the content that we will be having at our conference. And so far, we've gotten an amazing turnout and really amazing feedback. So we really thank you guys for spending this time with us. And I'm um, really excited about this one. We're talking about trait and genetic counseling, which is something that I don't think we talk about enough as a community. I think there's this assumption that a genetic counselor is just going to automatically tell you you can't have a baby if you have trait or if you have sickle cell. And that is not true. So um, this is a little bit different because we've been starting with one presentation, but tonight we actually have two experts who are going to be presenting. So Dr. Tamia Austin, she's no stranger. She does not need introduction. <laughs> the executive director of the Aswan Foundation and our go-to for trait in the sickle cell community. And then after her presentation, we're going to have Barbara Harrison, who is an amazing genetic counselor. Um, she means the world to me. She helps us see right out a lot. So I'm honored that she's here with us. So I'm going to stop talking and let these two take it over. So Dr. Austin, I think you're starting. I am starting and I just have to say thank you so much. I have been a fangirl of yours since the first time I saw you, I believe at an FCDAA and y'all did like the game show thing. And uh, I was just, just, so to be in your virtual presence once again is an honor. And, and I certainly appreciate the opportunity to present um, uh, with uh, Ms. Harrison and, and, and to, to have sickle cell trait, uh, you know, discussed once again, you know, it's, it's certainly uh, more and more and more and more and more is needed, but we, we appreciate this opportunity. So with that, I am going to jump right in and hopefully, okay, I'm presenting. And is it showing my whole screen? I don't think so. Is that better? Is that, okay, here okay, we are. Yeah. Okay, so what's in those genes, the genetic genes, not the J-E-A-N-S genes? <laughs> uh, genetic Counseling and Trait Roundtable. Again, I'm super excited to discuss this topic tonight with SC Red and all of you in the audience. I represent the As One Foundation, where our mission is to empower families globally, delivering life-saving sickle cell education. We were established in 2007. Unfortunately, our origin story is one um, uh, that began in tragedy, but we are triumphing every day uh, with the memory of our dear Devon Darling, who is our why. He passed away on February 26, 2001, due to sickle cell trade exertion. And I'm also dedicating this presentation tonight to Deputy Hassan Anthony Hacker, who uh, recently died in, in March, but yesterday, I believe it was announced uh, by the coroner that his death was, in fact, due to exertional sickling. I'm going to just go back just a quick sec to Devon. Um, because just to tell you that they learned that they had the sickle cell trait uh, upon entering Florida State University as young athletes, and they uh, were given information uh, that is pretty standard, but they were not given the information that we're going to share with you tonight. And certainly we believe had they been uh, the recipient of that information, Devon would still be here. Uh, these are identical twins that were born in Nassau, Bahamas, and their uh, mother, father, the doctors experienced their pregnancy expecting one child and were surprised when Devon and Devart were born because throughout the pregnancy, they had been hearing two hearts beating as one, hence the name of our foundation. And he serves certainly as our inspiration. We believe his heart continues to beat through every member of our sickle cell family uh, that is uh, impressed or uh, empowered through the work that we do uh, and that we partner to do. Uh, I know I don't have to tell you all about the prevalence of this very common, most common genetic disorder. 
And I often include this slide, distinguishing sickle cell trait from sickle cell disease, because believe it or not, very too many, too many folks don't realize there, there is a difference. Um, and I'll just distinguish that sickle cell trait certainly is um, of, of natural selection and has been, uh, it, is, it is protective uh, from malaria, but the, we're gonna discuss why sickle cell trait matters very briefly. It is the most common genetic disorder. It is definitely something that represents people of African descent disproportionately but it certainly affects people of Asian, Indian, Latin, Italian, Greek, Irish, um, Caribbean, Mediterranean, Turkish descent. So literally anyone. Um, but why are we here tonight? Um, I, I, I certainly know that Ms. Harrison is gonna get into the nitty gritty of this, but I just drill home that two people living with sickle cell trait who decide to birth children have a 25% chance of birthing someone with sickle cell disease. And 50%, uh, they have a 50% chance of birthing uh, someone else with sickle cell trait. And this is with each pregnancy. The, the graphic here is showing the rolling of the dice. With each pregnancy, this is possible. And then the other side of that is every one of our sickle cell disease warriors offspring will be uh, at least born with sickle cell trait. Um, so the, the likelihood of symptomology certainly has to do with the percentage of the abnormal hemoglobin, but that's why we're here to discuss, you know, the, you know, the what ifs and whatever decision that is made going forward with uh, your, your reproductive health is one that is informed. That's the whole goal, is to, to be informed and make informed decisions. As we said, this is a genetics thing, not a skin color thing. So all of us, re regardless of your ethnicity, know your status and, and, and be able to articulate that to your offspring and, and, and those in your circles of influence. Briefly, I have to hit on the myths associated with sickle cell trait. It's often characterized as being benign, uh, affecting only African-Americans, nothing to worry about. And then when it comes to the athletic community, uh, uh, stigmatizing and, ad and athletes have an adverse attitude toward testing. B benign is de defined as mild type, does not threaten life or health, not cancerous, asymptomatic, not causing, marked by, or presenting with signs or symptoms of infection, illness, or disease. These are the two main ways that sickle cell trait is described in the literature. But however, these are um, complications associated with sickle cell trait in not so emerging research. Um, there's, there's aging research that is showing sickle cell trait to be associated with a number of conditions, including chronic fatigue, splenic infarction, pneumococcal disease, blood clots, venous thrombolysis, retinopathy, kidney injury, even acute chest syndrome, avascular necrosis, the exertional sickling is what we uh, primarily deal with, with with regards to our education with the As One Foundation, uh, sudden death, and unfortunately, even COVID-19. I won't belabor these slides, but I'm just giving you a visual of the complications that are associated with sickle cell trait in the literature. And there are the slides that, and I've, I've cited the research and these are just one. There are several. There are several uh, pieces of pieces of research that uh, indicate these. And you are welcome to screenshot this and do your own research. The the idea today is to be informed. But uh, growing pains. And I, I I I say, look, if you are 40 years old, you have sickle cell trait, and you're still having body aches, especially especially those that you know I, i'm told in the same place on your body and i just want to qualify i am not a, a clinician i am a researcher i am repeating to you what i have read and experienced in the research or what has been reported to me 40 years old still having that ache and pain um that's not growing pains it, it's just not growing pains but anyway please see your doctor and discuss it with them 
exertional sickling is what happened to Devon Darling. And even though exertional sickling or sickle cell trait does not have a cause of death code, his death certificate says exhaustion and dehydration with rhabdomyolysis complicated by sickle cell trait. And even COVID-19, here's three uh, citations of uh, associate, a research associating COVID-19 with sickle cell trait. Uh, but here is the newborn screening, which we are happy to have here in the United States. Uh, pretty routinely, if there's a positive diagnosis of sickle cell disease, uh, the, the family is notified when, when sickle cell trait is the diagnosis, you may get a notification um, by mail or a phone call. And that's not consistent across all the states. But they're informing you that it's not a disease. You'll live a normal life. They give you a brief planning, family planning advice and the, the notification about the 25% chance of birthing a child with disease. Um, and little to no follow-up because, hey, there's nothing to worry about. However, our research is telling us that there are three main risk factors for sickle cell trait, dehydration, elevation, exertion, and then the possibility, the very rare, very outlying possibility of renal medullary carcinoma only because 100% of the patients that are diagnosed with renal medullary carcinoma are sickle cell trait warriors. Uh, there is actually a new uh, piece of research that I, I read the other day that explains what is happening with the blood blockage to the kidney and, and all of that. That is why that renal medullary uh, shows up in those living with sickle cell trait. And no warning about the protective factors, uh, especially when it comes to exertion. Sickle cell trait is classified as the top non-injury killer of athletes. There's, those are the ones that tend to do the exerting. Uh, if they are educated about the risk factors and these protective factors to go from rest to exertion gradually, if they're in the case of working out, or on the field or inside a gym, you go from rest to exertion gradually. You know, don't jump on the treadmill and go 15 miles per hour or, or, or whatever the speed is. You got to go gradually. Always, you know, hydration is important for all of us, regardless of our sickle cell trait status. Hydrate before, during, and after any physical activity. And we also admonish that you consume half your body weight in ounces of water per day. If you are not consuming half your body weight in ounces of water every day, sickle cell, sickle cell trait or not, you are dehydrated. And usually in person, when I present this, I ask any, it, tell me by show of hands, how many consumed half their body weight in ounces of water yesterday and are hydrated, uh, you know, dehydrated today. And all the hands go up because, because most people are not achieving that. And that is, an important um, way to stay hydrated, practice good hydration, sickle cell, sickle cell trait or not. And we know our, our sickle cell warriors need hydration. So hydrate before, during, and after, and consume half your body weight in ounces of water a day. And also take recovery breaks. Um, I would wager, and I do not know, all I know is that uh, our deputy, may he rest in peace, was engaged in a physical conditioning workout. Those are the long workouts without breaks. And when those breaks are not allowed, that uh, creates the danger zone for our trait warriors. They need to be able to take breaks, put the hands on the hips, put the you know, hands over your head in the cobra pose or take a knee, something like that, uh, you know, to take a break to allow for recovery because we know our sickle cells take longer to regenerate than normal red blood cells. Simply put, warm up, drink up, rest up. Remember, going gradually from intensity to exertion, warm up, hydrate, drink up, recovery breaks, rest up, warm up, drink up, rest up. That is our education, regardless of your age, regardless of your trait status, regardless of your sickle cell status, Regardless of anything, warm up, drink up, rest up is the is the 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 treatment for everybody. <laughs> I'm using that loosely because again, I am not a clinician. 
Um, where could these conversations, where could that advice be shared? Right now, uh, sickle cell trait conversations are pretty much taking place at diagnosis. If you are going to play NCAA sport, National Collegiate Athletic Association sports, and unfortunately, after it's too late, either you are finding out by surprise that your child was born with disease. So you, you just found out. And I can tell you, it's been hundreds of people that I've spoken to who did not know that they had sickle cell trait until their child was born with sickle cell disease. And I am not trying to be dramatic, but provocative, yes, because to get people to think after it's too late, that's subjective. But would you want to know beforehand? Would you want to know what to expect? I think that is the question. Um, when you get the diagnosis, uh, what are the discussions? What is the parent's knowledge? What is the child's knowledge? Are there any other opportunities for screening mandates? Uh, because after all, we have people that were born prior to the newborn screenings that are of uh, childbearing age. What about the Im immigrant population? Should education be taking place in not just college, but middle and high school? Because young athletes are still dying. Young people are still dying. Um, what we believe are preventable deaths. So we propose these 10 times, and certainly there could possibly be more, but family planning, genetic counseling, diagnosis, more sensitive testing, in school testing and education, transitioning from pediatrics to adult, dating and sex education. Yes, the NCAA sports, universal education. Think about what happens every October. The world turns pink, football turned pink, fire trucks turn pink. You go in the big box store and the irons are pink. Universal education. Everyone's not going to have breast cancer, but we're all being educated about it. Everyone's not going to have sickle cell or sickle cell disease. But everybody needs to know about it. Some, if something that's affecting 4 million people in the United States, that's worthy of universal education and awareness. And then finally, the recruitment of those sickle cell allies, those unaffected by abnormal hemoglobin in their blood, but they care enough to care. These are 10 times, including those three prior times, not including when it's too late, that we could be talking about it. And we are certainly grateful for this opportunity um, to present with, with SC Red to discuss it tonight. Just briefly, this is the exertional sickling that takes, this is how sick, uh, exertional sickling actually looks, that uh, takes athletes' lives early, uh, those that exert early. And the, the, the point of this slide is just to show you that sometimes things like cramping can be mistaken for actual sickle cell exertional crisis. Uh, crisis. So it's important to understand the, the understand the differences to avoid, you know, the, the sudden death, the hospitalization. As we said earlier, because sickle cell trait is has been classified as the top uh, killer of athletes, you know, predominantly affecting those of African American uh, African descent, uh, and that in this. This is, you know, brought, got the attention of the NCAA, which is why the mandate is even in place at, in the first place. Uh, DeVard's family actually sought uh, a legal case against Florida State University, and they were awarded, uh, I guess, some like $2.8 million, which does not replace Devon by any stretch of the imagination. But what is really working is education, what we're doing right now. What is that? This is what is working. We just need more and more of it. And we need it in the schools. We need it in the police academies. We need it, you know, in at the on the marching band fields. We need it for those that are trying to run a marathon. We need it uh, for reproductive education symposiums. And this is just to give you six faces of fall and sickle cell trait young people gone too soon. Devon Darling is there uh, to the left of your screen. Um, and as you see, Shanice Clark, this is not just something that affects athletes that play football. She is a female, obviously, and she plays uh, women's basketball. Her death was originally attributed to choking on bubble gum, but the coroner uh, um, eventually uh, ruled that her death was caused by 
sickle cell trait and acute rhabdomyolysis. <clears throat> and this unfortunately is a fate not just reserved for adults. These are young people, high school age, middle school age, and even Pop Warner age um, who died in a, uh, a sickle cell trait exertion, and I still believe preventable deaths. But it does, the story doesn't have to end that way. It is a positive story because we all have a role. Everyone and anyone can be an ally and allies even have a genotype. It's, it's AA, two copies of normal adult hemoglobin. That's an ally. You can be an ally. You can care enough to care. You don't have to be born with sickle cell or sickle cell trait to make a difference. You can donate. You can help educate. You can be a champion on the school campuses, uh, talking to coaches, you know, talking to military personnel. You can share or notify us of opportunities to educate the community. Find out your genotype um, and, and help us spread the word. That's it for me, and I'll look forward to questions uh, when time permits. Thank you. I always, I get on every round table, Wendy, that I come off thinking <laughs> I'm ready to speak and I'm needed. But um, thank you, Dr. Austin. That presentation was amazing. I love the call to action at the end. And speaking of allies, let's get into Ms. Harrison's presentation. Yeah, absolutely. So good evening, everyone. I'm, I'm very excited to be here. Shan or Cher in the fangirlism of Tiana of being here um, in her presence uh, with you as well, Dr. Austin. Um, I'm really glad that we've made this connection through this event. And I am um, just particularly excited about um, being able to talk a little bit with, um, with everyone today um, about genetic counseling and kind of what we can bring to the table. So I'm going to go ahead and share my slides. Now, unfortunately, when I do this, I'm not able to see you all. So can someone just confirm that you can see this? My whole slide? We can see you. Now I don't see any faces. Okay. All right. So today or this evening, I just want to spend a few minutes um, talking about sickle cell disease trait and informed reproductive decisions. And so as I'm talking about genetic counseling today, um, I am focusing kind of in this prenatal reproductive realm, preconception realm. Um, genetic counselors operate in many other areas as well and pediatrics and cancer and, and many other areas. But today this is really going to be obviously our focus. And so, um, so Dr. Austin has done a phenomenal job already of really um, using many of the, much of the terminology um, that we use when we talk about sickle cell disease and trade. And I don't want to spend too much time belaboring this because I'm sure many in the audience are familiar, but just in case we have some folks out there who may be a little bit newer to this area, um, I just wanted to share uh, just a little bit of information about disease and hemoglobin and genotypes and just kind of what all those terms mean. So, um, so of course, you know that sickle cell disease is a condition that involves our hemoglobin. And um, can you confirm, can you see my cursor moving around? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, great. So these here are red blood cells and you can see they're circular cells. Um, and importantly, they're they're kind of mushy. They can squeeze as you can see here. And, and inside of these red blood cells are many different things. But one of the things that's in here is something called hemoglobin. So hemoglobin is basically um, a protein or substance, but its job is to carry oxygen. That's really all that hemoglobin is, is prescribed to do. And, um, and so it carries that oxygen. Those red blood cells, of course, travel through our blood vessels um, and take that oxygen, as well as other things that are in that red blood cell, so water and nutrients and other things. But it takes those to the different parts of our body through those blood vessels. And some of those vessels are very tiny. Um, and so sometimes those cells have to squeeze through even one at a time. And so one analogy I use here is that these red blood cells are almost like bean bags with those beans inside being the hemoglobin. Now, um, just like our eye color, hair color, um, skin color, 
there is variety amongst us, right? And so it's actually true that there's a variety of types of hemoglobin, right? And so hemoglobin A, which you've heard a little bit about, is the most common type of hemoglobin. And it's just kind of the regular hemoglobin that carries its oxygen and does its job. But the next most common type of hemoglobin is hemoglobin S or sickle hemoglobin. Now hemoglobin S also is inside of those red blood cells, because that's where our hemoglobin is found. Um, but when it carries that oxygen and drops it off, it starts to act a little differently. And so what happens is that those pieces of hemoglobin inside start to stick to each other, and they basically make these rods almost inside of the cell, or sticks almost, of hemoglobin. And because of that, those cells become very rigid. So no longer are they... Um, no longer are those cells like a bean bag. Now it's more like a bag of sticks. And so they're hard, they're rigid, and they just can't move through as well. And then there's other things that are going on and kind of how the body responds to this in a way that makes this become pretty much like a clot. And so now there's no blood flow going on. And because there's no blood flow going on, that part of the body wants to let the brain know this is happening. And one way that it does that is through pain. Um, and so we're not going to talk, you know, about all the different parts and symptoms of sickle cell, but um, this is certainly one cause of the, the pain that individuals with, uh, with sickle cell disease go through. So, um, so we know that sickle cell is a genetic condition, but what does that really mean? So, so just entertain me for a few minutes. We're going to have a little mini genetics lesson, and it's just to provide this reminder, may have been, you know, quite a few years ago for some of us, of what genes are and what genetics are, what genetics is. So our genes tell us all those different things about our bodies. We talked about some eye color, hair color, the type of hemoglobin you have. It tells us things like how we digest our food, how our muscles move, how our heart functions, all of those things. So our genetic information it's kind of like an instruction booklet. And that information is located in our DNA, which is packaged on chromosomes, which are found in all of our cells. And so um, our chromosomes that contain that genetic information, we've gotten those from our parents. We've gotten half of those from the egg and half of those from the sperm that then combine to give us whatever we have. But what that means is that that similar type of information, so the information for hemoglobin, the information about eye color and hair color, we get one version of that from the egg and one version of that from the sperm. And so that's why when we start talking about this genotype, you see those two letters because it's just de kind of delineating one that came from one parent and what came from the other parent. Hemoglobin A, as we said before, is the type of hemoglobin um, that's most common. Then right under that is hemoglobin S, um, which again acts a little differently. I also wanted to stick in here about beta thalassemia. That's a term that some people, you know, throw around as well. It is a legitimate term. Um, and it's a little bit... It, it is also a type of um, what we call hemoglobinopathy, meaning it's a different type of hemoglobin process that's going on. But what's going on with beta thalassemia is that a person is making hemoglobin A, so they're making the regular type of hemoglobin, they're just not making as much of it as we would expect. And so therefore, they can have challenges with carrying oxygen and that kind of thing simply because there's not as much there. All right, so that's hemoglobin A, hemoglobin S, beta thalassemia, genes, you're a combination of both parents. And so there are many different combinations that we can get, literally probably millions of combinations of that information that you've gotten from both parents that you can see in an individual. And again, be their genotype, which basically means what is on that gene level. What instructions do they have in that DNA? So again, most people have two copies of hemoglobin A. They've gotten one from their, you know, one from the egg, one from the sperm, and they just have those two copies AA. Then you have individuals that have received a hemoglobin A, those instructions from one parent, 
But from the other parent, they inherited a different uh, uh, instructions for a different type of hemoglobin. And so that could be hemoglobin S, which is kind of the most common next combination that we see, right? So that would be hemoglobin AS or what we would commonly call sickle cell trait. There's hemoglobin AC because there are many different types of hemoglobin. S is just the start. There's C, there's D, there's E. <laughs> you really kind of go down the alphabet. There's some types of hemoglobin that are made after the people who discovered them, other ones that are made, named after the city in which they were found. Um, and so there's many different combinations. So an individual can carry i.e. meaning they've gotten the regular um, A copy from one parent, but then carry something different on the other side. The body figures out that that hemoglobin A works better, usually, than whatever that other variant is. And so therefore, most individuals who are carriers will have a predominance of hemoglobin A in their system. If I were to look in one of those cells and bust it open and try to count, you know, how many hemoglobin A's do I see versus how many hemoglobin S's, they would have more hemoglobin A's. But as Dr. Austin noted, there can be variation in those percentages. And that might start to give us some clues about trying to predict or try to get an idea about who might have complications associated with sickle cell trait in particular, um, you know, as they, as they go on. Now, sickle cell disease occurs when a person has inherited hemoglobin S from at least one parent, and then usually have also inherited a hemoglobin S from the other parent. That's kind of what we call classic sickle cell disease. But then there, are, again, are variations. You can inherit hemoglobin S and inherit a different type, and then you can have hemoglobin SC or SD or this S beta thalassemia, right? Those individuals, they have hemoglobin A in their system, but their bodies aren't making as much of it. And so therefore you see the effects of that hemoglobin S um, coming out. All right, so that's your genotypes, right? So we have all these different combinations. Um, if you have a hemoglobin A present, typically you're what we call a carrier. If you're AS, then we call that sickle cell trait. You have your different forms of sickle cell disease. SS is most common, but then people can have other types of sickle cell as well. All right, now how would you even know then what kind of hemoglobin you have? And again, Dr. Austin already mentioned that there are different ways to test for this. And so I wanted to run through a few of them here just in case you run into these or if you wanna ask your physician or your healthcare provider that you wanna know what type of hemoglobin you have. Because let's, I, I, I point I often have to make clear to individuals when I see them is that you really don't know the type of hemoglobin you have unless you get tested, right? So I've had people say, oh, I don't have trade. No one in my family has disease, you know, and that, and that's really does not tell you anything because an individual with sickle cell trait could not have any symptoms. They would never know. And it's not until they actually get tested that they actually, you know, find this out. So hemoglobin electrophoresis is one of the more common ways to determine what kind of hemoglobin you have. Now, this is done through a blood test. Um, and basically, it separates those hemoglobin molecules get separated in a way that we can tell what type of hemoglobin is present. Is it hemoglobin S? Is it A? Is it C? Et cetera. It doesn't give a good give us a good idea about those percentages. There's a different test that can give us that information, but um, but it does give us um, some good information about the types of hemoglobin that are present. The complete blood count. I kind of just threw this in here. Now CBC is also what it's known as. It's very common. A lot of people have CBC for many different reasons. This allows us to look at at the red blood cells, look at what size they are, can tell us kind of the um, amount of hemoglobin that's inside of a cell. We can look at the shape and the size. It also tells us the complete blood count tells you about your white blood cells and reticulocytes and all other kind of, you know, things that we can find in our blood. But importantly, that complete blood count can indicate that a person may be a carrier for beta thalassemia, which is something that you might not pick up in that hemoglobin electrophoresis. So that complete blood count can be an important component of testing as well. And then we have certainly gotten ourselves now 
with genetic testing to a point that we can actually just look at the DNA sequence and be able to tell someone, do you have, you know, what do you have on that genetic level? Are you AA or AS or SS, right? So we can get that information now just by drawing someone's blood and just looking at their genetics. They're looking at that gene um, that's changed in sickle cell disease. Um, and so that way you don't have to depend on something like the electrophoresis or a complete blood count. You can just kind of cut straight to the chase and <laughs> just look at that genetic testing. So, um, so Dr. Austin talked about the times that um, we can screen or that people get screened for sickle cell. And it's, and I, I just wanted to point out these three points in time specifically. So one is newborn screening. Um, as noted earlier, um, sickle cell disease is included in newborn screening throughout the United States. And as also noted, that notification about traits specifically varies greatly. So the purpose of newborn screening is to identify babies who have sickle cell disease or have whatever other genetic disease that is included in that newborn screening panel. And so that's where states have um, prioritized spending their money, you know, being able to track down those families so that they can get to that prophylactic penicillin for babies with sickle cell, you know, so they can get to see a hematologist. And so unfortunately, though, that means that when people are, or when babies are identified as having sickle cell trait or being a carrier for a different type of hemoglobin, there is not as much emphasis on that. There's not the emphasis to try to track down those parents. But what's important for us to understand is that that um, when a baby is born with sickle cell trait, there is a significant possibility that those parents are actually both have trait themselves. Because as was shared earlier, when both parents have trait, there's a 50% chance that that baby's going to have trait. And so maybe that's what happened in that pregnancy. But in the next pregnancy, that couple could have a child with sickle cell disease. And so there is definitely merit in going back and tracking down or giving more information as was proposed um, by Dr. Austin to get more information to those parents about what this could mean, not only for their baby, but also for themselves. Um, and trying to, you know, provide testing or have resources for testing for those parents as well. Um, the whole issue around testing college athletes is really a hot one. Um, as very well noted and very well explained, the tragedy of individuals with sickle cell trait um, dying on the football field, on the basketball court, is really ones that can be avoided. And I think Dr. Austin did a wonderful job, an awesome job of explaining some of those precautions that need to be taken of hydration, um, of taking breaks um, during a workout and building up a workout because you what often not always but what often happens in those cases is a situation where someone's in that summer workout where they haven't worked out all the way and it's particularly for football they haven't really worked out they come in in you know July and start trying to work out a whole lot when it's hot when they're not conditioned yet and then you have this you know very tragic ending. Now, as she also noted, um, many professional bodies have not supported this policy of testing all collegiate athletes. And this is something that maybe we can delve into later if it's something we want to talk about. But I just wanted to point out some of those reasons why. Um, and some of these professional bodies include the SCDAA, that was noted, the American Society of Hematology. Um, one of the reasons is because the only requirement of the policy is that you get tested. It doesn't say what kind of testing is required. There is a very cheap type of testing that can be done where it only indicates whether a person has hemoglobin S in their system. It doesn't pick up the other types of carrier status, which is okay in the sense that those other types of carrier status, your AC, your A beta thalassemia, they have not been associated with that exertional um, death risk. 
However, the thought that a college athlete would be told they're having a sickle cell test, have a test, they come back negative, they're going to assume that they're negative. They're not thinking about these other types of hemoglobin. And there's no education that goes along with it to help people understand that those other you know, possibilities are out there. In addition, you know, and I know from doing this at Howard University, when we would have athletes come down, they literally are like, I need to have this test so I can get back out and work out. <laughs> right? There is not an emphasis on education, on even understanding what sickle cell disease is, what trait is, what it can mean to them beyond the, you know, the risk that can be associated with their athletic activity. So none of that is really specified either. And so those things are really what was of concern. Um, in addition to concerns around discrimination and other things that might follow our black athletes in particular when this type of policy was rolled out. And then the other area, kind of main time when people might be tested is in preconception. When they're thinking about having children or more often when they're actually pregnant. Um, what has been amazing to me, and I'm so glad this finally got resolved, was that the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, only in August 20, 2022, finally recommended that all women have be screened for hemoglobinopathies. Prior to August 2022, they said that only people of African descent should actually have um, the full kind of type of screening. And for others, it should just be offered. And we know that, you know, as was noted, skin color doesn't equal your genes at all. <laughs> um, it's a, you know, those are completely two kind of separate parts of your genome, right? So just knowing that you're Black isn't going to tell you whether or not you're at risk for sickle cell. If you're going to do it, you need to offer it to everybody. And so finally, um, the American College of Sectors and Gynecology you know, kind of really noted that. And now it is um, offered or recommended to, to all pregnant couples and preconception as well. Um, so we have already heard a little bit about how um, sickle cell disease is inherited and kind of what those risks are. Um, so just some things I wanna point out here. Um, so if you have two parents that have sickle cell trait, then yes, there's this 50% chance that their child will have trait, 25% chance that their child would have disease. Um, something we don't talk a lot about is what's the risk for the person that actually has sickle cell disease, right? So if a person has sickle cell and their partner has trait, then it's, there's a 50% chance their child would be born with trait and a 50% chance their child would be born with um, with sickle cell disease. Now, of course, it would depend on what is this person for trait for. Here, it's the it's the more common AS. But if this was S, you know, AC, then it would be a risk for SC disease down here, right? So that's going to depend on kind of the specific genotype of those individuals. If one parent has sickle cell disease, the other person doesn't have disease or trait, then as was said before, all of their children will have sickle cell trait, but there is not a risk for disease. But what can be tricky, and it's, it's um, I have definitely seen this happen, is individuals have partial testing, think that they're just AA, but they really have beta thalassemia or, you know, they're carry beta thalassemia. Again, where they have that A gene, that, um, I'm sorry, they have hemoglobin A, but they're not making it to the same amount as is typical. And so they actually have the carrier for beta thalassemia. They pass that down to their child at the same time that their partner passes down that S gene and their child ends up with sickle beta thalassemia. And it's a surprise. Nobody knew. I thought I had testing. They told me I didn't carry sickle cell trait. Well, no, but there are these other variants, other things that can um, combine with sickle cell and cause a form of sickle cell disease. Um, so if a couple finds themselves in a situation of um, facing the possibility of having a child with sickle cell, what are their options? And this is really where the genetic counselor comes in. So we can certainly be involved with the testing and screening and being able to identify um, what a person's status is. But now that we have that information and I have this couple in front of me, um, 
that the conversation can go then to, okay, I'm facing this possibility. What are my options? And this is going to get more into it on in the next slide about how this is very personal decision. But some of the options that are out there, if a person, if a couple wants to try to lower or minimize their chance to have a child with sickle cell disease, um, would be, I'm just kind of going stepwise and kind of in a timeline. So in the very beginning, in that preconception time, um, we can have discussions about assisted reproductive technologies. So these are options like using a donor egg, if it is the, um, the, uh, the woman who is, you know, has sickle cell disease, or, you know, even in the trait situation, um, might that person of the couple may be the one to say, okay, you can use a donor egg and then use my partner's sperm or vice versa. Um, even a donor embryo um, are options around assisted reproductive technology. So these are ways of having children outside of the typical, you know, intercourse situation um, of really um, having this happen more or less in a lab. Um, so you can harvest eggs, you can harvest sperm, you can um, people donate embryos um, that have been formed already um, to then give that to other couples. So all those are options. Um, if a person wants to, or if a couple says, no, you know, I want to use, I want to have all my other genetic information there. I just want to not have that sickle one in there. Um, then they may look into something like pre-implantation diagnosis. So this is when we would use the egg and sperm from the couple. But then once those embryos are formed, we can do testing, genetic testing on those embryos, and then um, identify those embryos that have that genotype of disease and then not use those to implant back to mom. So in that situation, we could select for embryos that are not affected by disease. Then we have um, your prenatal diagnosis diagnostic options. Um, so this is when a person is already pregnant, we can offer um, a few different um, procedures. So there's chorionic villus sampling or CVS, which is offered between 11 and about 14 weeks. Um, or 11 to 13 weeks. So this is very relatively early in the pregnancy toward the end of the first trimester. There's testing that can be done um, after 16 weeks. That's called amniocentesis. Both of these do have a risk of miscarriage um, or premature labor for the pregnancy. So this is something that comes with a lot of conversation around it. Also, it is going to, it could cause there to be a very obviously stressful situation for the couple um, if they get this information while they're pregnant. There's also um, upcoming kind of developments of being able to get um, um, not a diagnosis, but to be able to say what the chances for sickle cell disease and the fetus based on doing maternal serum testing, so actually getting blood from mom, but inside of mom's blood when she's pregnant is also DNA from the fetus. And so we are getting to the point where we're going to be able to isolate that fetal DNA and look at that genetic information and say, there's a really high chance, not just 25%, but you know, 80%, 90% that this baby that you're carrying actually has sickle cell disease. This testing is already being used for other genetic conditions like Down syndrome and a few others. So this technology is, is down to pike and is being used. And so this is really the next natural step is to use it for these types of genetic conditions. And then we talk about adoption. Some couples say, you know, I, I don't wanna explore these other options for whatever reasons, I will choose to adopt and create my family that way. And of course, that is something that is, is welcomed and, and discussed as well. Um, so my last slide here is just to talk a little bit about that process of genetic counseling and some of the issues that we discuss with, um, with couples as they're going through this process. So ideally, of course, genetic counseling would happen preconception before individuals are pregnant. Um, some are even interested in doing this before they decide to be engaged or to really commit seriously to a relationship to really think about um, these issues beforehand. But 
honestly, most often genetic counseling happens once folks are pregnant. <laughs> so, uh, but regardless of when it occurs, it's a genetic counseling is basically an opportunity to learn more about what are my specific chances to have a child with sickle cell disease? What are the screening tests, testing options, you know, all those things I just talked about all those things, and including the process and the cost. So something like assisted reproductive technology and using your donor eggs or doing, you know, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis sounds wonderful. It's also very costly. And for the most part, insurance companies do not pay for it, particularly if you're not infertile. So if you're fertile and able to have children, it's very hard to get an insurance company to pay for something that's going to help you get pregnant, even though it seems logical and you may have your reasons behind it. But just the reality is that it can be in a very expensive endeavor. It's also very emotionally taxing endeavor. It can be a very physically taxing endeavor for a woman to go through the, the process of harvesting eggs and so forth. It's, it's a major undertaking. And so there's definitely reasons why individuals don't choose that route, even though it's available. And we hope that it can be kind of offered in a more accessible and just way um, in the future. But for right now, um, finances can definitely be a, a uh, um, barrier. The prenatal testing is similar, right? So now prenatal testing is generally covered by insurance. However, it can leave people in very difficult situations of, hey, I'm, you know, almost halfway through my pregnancy. And now I find out I'm carrying that my baby has sickle cell disease. What am I doing with that information? Am I choosing to end the pregnancy? Am I choosing to keep the pregnancy? Am I going to put my baby up for adoption if I feel like that's really not something that I can handle? Um, those are really tough conversations. And we talk about them a lot kind of before we get there, but often what people think they're going to do and then what they actually do in the moment are two completely separate things. Um, and I've seen it just go both ways. So um, again, that's something we can revisit and talk about. But just to understand that these conversations are extremely personal. Um, they can be impacted by a person's cultural views, their spiritual views, their family experiences, what their experiences with sickle cell have been, whether it be the person themselves having the condition, whether it be them seeing a loved one have it, and what that person's experience with it has been, that has a great impact on one on a on a person's decision. And so we see decisions across the spectrum. And the important thing about genetic counseling, which I'm so glad that uh, Tiana, said in, Tiana said in the beginning, is that it is client-centered. I am not here to tell a person they should have kids or shouldn't have kids, or they should be with someone or they shouldn't be with someone. Because I personally think that needs to be based on a lot of different factors. Um, but that's even my personal view. For someone else, that first thing on that list of what they're looking for might be you cannot have sickle cell trait. And if you do, then we just don't even need to have this conversation. And to understand that for some people, that's going to be their approach. For somebody else, it's not going to be their approach. And we need to make it safe for everybody to approach it in the way that works for them. What we want to avoid is that child that's born with sickle cell disease and the couple says, I had no idea. Now, that's not what we want. That's what we're trying to avoid. If you make a conscious decision, if you've talked it through, you've, you know, have all these things that are factoring into that decision and whatever way that decision leads you, then that's okay as long as it's informed, it's not coerced, you don't feel like you're forced, you have a societal pressure to do something that you don't want to do, um, that you feel like people around you are judging you depending on you know how you decide. That's what we're trying to avoid because when you start to tip that line, you get into eugenics, you get into, you get into things that we really, really uh, want to avoid from a, certainly from a genetic counseling standpoint, from a genetic testing standpoint, from a societal standpoint, because when we start to say, you know, this is normal and this is not, and we need to avoid this. And, you know, we really have to watch the language that we use. We have to watch um, how we kind of approach these issues. And it is very, very complex. And there can be people who have very strong feelings um, on those sides of those issues. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it off. <laughs> I hope I didn't get like too many crazy looks as I was talking. I couldn't see anybody. I was like, I'm um, and I definitely look forward to our Q and A. Thank you so much for your time.
Thank you. That was amazing. And you really embody everything that we at SC Writer are about. And I know that Dr. Austin as one, um, like you said, like none of us are up here judging. We're not going to tell anybody how to live their life. It really is about informed and shared decision making. And, you know, that's why we started SC Red. We wanted people to have information. We wanted people to have resources and options. And so I'm really glad that you did include that slide about um, the donor eggs and the different assisted reproductive technologies. And I will just say that we at SC Red are working tirelessly yes. with FDA, CMS, um, all of these entities to try to make those options more accessible and also working on our own fertility preservation grant. We have one with Be The Match, but it's not inclusive enough. So mm -hmm. there is hope we're working on it. Um, I did see a couple of people had some questions, but it looks like you answered them during the presentation. There is one question. Can we predict the severity of prenatal pathogenic variant of HBB gene so that we can counsel the patient regarding that prognosis? So I think what the question is asking is pretty much like, can we predict the severity of disease, right? If I can tell you you have sickle cell disease, can I tell you, you know, where you're going to fall in that spectrum? And the short answer is no. <laughs> we have not gotten there yet. Yeah. Um, there are, there are, um, not to get too much into like more complex genetics, but there's what we call haplotypes, kind of different types of even that hemoglobin S gene. Um, but um, it, that we thought would start to kind of, it, which basically like kind of, um, when you look along the sequence and look around the gene that's changed, which is what the HBB that they were talking about, that's the name of the actual gene that's changed in sickle cell disease. Mm -hmm. um, but in any case, like kind of before that gene and after that gene, there's also DNA and genetic information. And so we kind of started to look at that to see are changes there, things that can predict what might lead to a more severe kind of outcome or not, but it, it has not proven itself to be informative. So mm. yeah, unfortunately, the short answer is no. All right. Well, both of you, thank you so much for your presentations. And we are going to bring up our amazing panelists because we are all about hearing the lived experience. So I'm really excited um, to get into this conversation. Francine, I'm, gl I'm glad you're up here. I know you were having some connection issues, but we don't want to do this without you. So um, before we get into the discussion, let's just have everybody introduce themselves. So I'll just go in order. And Brenda, I'll start with you. Good evening, everybody. My name is Brenda Green, and I am a mom of a warrior. Uh, my son, Brayden, 17, he has sickle cell SC disease. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Um, Dia, you want to go next? Yes, my name is Dia Hicks, founder of SwaggerScan.com, and I have the trait for sickle cell and a very powerful testimony to go along with it. Thank you for being here, Francine. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Francine Baker. Um, I am the mother of two young adults with um, sickle SS disease, um, and I am also very happy to be here and look forward to our conversation. Thanks for joining us. So, Dr. Austin, I'll kick off the conversation with like two questions, and then I'll let you pop in, and you can close this out. Um, so, Brenda, let's start with you. How old were you when you found out that you had a trait, and what were the circumstances? Um, how old was I when I had my 17 year old? That's when I found out when my, my son was diagnosed uh, with sickle cell and my husband has sickle trait mm -hmm. and I have hemoglobin C. So one of those variants of, um, the abnormal hemoglobin. So I was not aware until my son was, um, diagnosed at the newborn screening that my husband had the trait and I had an abnormal hemoglobin C. So Mm. That's when I found out. We will come right back to you. Okay. Dia, what about you? How old were you and what were the circumstances when you found out? Uh, mine kind of coincides with pretty much everything you guys have discussed uh, in the beginning uh, with the athletics. Uh, 
I played collegiate sports and I was diagnosed. Uh, <clears throat> I was diagnosed after um, feeling under the weather during practice. And it was a very scary and, and interesting time because I found out that both I had the trait for sickle cell, which I knew nothing about. I thought I was being explained that I had cancer or something of that magnitude because I had no inkling of what it was and they didn't do a good job of explaining but they explained that it was hereditary and I then had to determine you know which of my parents had had the trait as well which was all a very interesting conversation I bet Francine what about you what were the circumstances and you found out yeah so um I actually knew I had um the trait from I was a little girl um, I, I don't know how I found out, <laughs> um, especially since I'm adopted. So the, the fact that I'm adopted means that I don't even know who I got mm -hmm. it from, whether I got it from my mother or my father, but, um, I knew from, I was little what that meant. However, um, I didn't fully understand until, um, I got married and had, um, two lovely children with sickle cell disease back to back. Um, and I learned quickly, uh, what it means to uh, be a carrier. Wow, so Brenda, we'll go back to you. Um, that had to be pretty overwhelming, but I want you to kind of walk us through what that was like, um, not just hearing about, well, what, what was that like when you had a son with sickle cell? Um, and he was early, he was premature, so I was already stressed out, um, and so at, we didn't find out until he was three months old. There was a, a miscommunication in his pediatrician at the hospital. So they called and they told me, um, sorry, Miss Green, your son has sickle cell disease. And I'm like, how? There's no way. I don't have the disease. I mean, I didn't understand. Um, so after some more conversations, it, I honestly was devastated because I went straight to Google. Mm. And, um, you know, and I was devastated initially and shocked. I thought that I prepared in advance and thought I knew everything and I was prepared mother. And I was like, how did I miss this and not know the chances of my child having sickle cell disease? So um, long story short, it, that was very hard. It's a hard period for me. And how did you work through that? Um, I had to get myself together because I realized it wasn't helping him because <laughs> mm -hmm. I was going through this woe is me, woe is Brenda, guilty phase, but it was not helping me and my husband learn more about how we needed to, um, what we needed to learn in order to make sure that he had the best chance of living a full productive life as possible. And so I just had to, and I have a praying family. So um, it came with prayer as well and support. I have a huge village. So with that in combination of amazing pediatrician who had had a sickle cell patient before mm -hmm. and a hematologist, I mean, all of it fell in, in line for us. So um, I knew I had to get over that and get past it to help him. That's great. I'm glad that you had an incredible support system around you. And I've met them and they are amazing. So Dia, we'll go to you. Um, you, in your intro, you said that you had like a really powerful testimony relating to this whole trait thing. So we want to hear about it. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, you know, I'd be remiss without mentioning my wife because this story does involve me meeting someone else. And uh, after discussing it with my wife, she's okay with me explaining the fact that it's about someone else. Um, and we both had lives before meeting one another. Um, and, the, and she also understands the power in the testimony. So with that said, I, I met someone else uh, about 10 years, uh, about 12 years ago now. And uh, without having any discussion, we, you know, got serious with one another and moved in with one another. Uh, so we were sharing space and uh, I had come to the conclusion that I wanted to marry this person. And so uh, her parent, her mother came, her father couldn't make her. her mother came to visit us and her and I went outside to talk because I was going to ask her mother for her daughter's hand. And her, her mother kind of 
got the inkling that uh, I was doing so because I'm asking her to come outside for a conversation. Um, so she began to beat me to the punch with my questions by questioning me. And she asked me questions that I wasn't expecting, you know, like, uh, you know, what are your plans, you know, five year, 10 year plan, well, you know, that kind of question. No, it was, uh, what is your health history? And I had no idea what, where she was going with this. And I'm just answering with my innocence, you know, uh, my health history is fine. Uh, we don't have any history of cancer or anything like that. It's like, well, no, that's not what I'm getting at. Uh, do you know uh, the history of your family involving sickle cell? And I'm like, no, well, we don't have sickle cell in my family. All I have is a trait. Just thinking I'm just, you know, home free. Let me get to what I pulled you out here for, <laughs> you know. And uh, the minute I said that, just the look of horror and disappointment came over her face. And I really didn't understand, you know, all of what was, you know, happening here. And she began to explain that her son, who she, who she had come with, has sickle cell, which is why she explained that, you know, he was sickly in appearance and that she had lost a son two years prior, another son from sickle cell. And that if I'm planning on, uh, excuse me, she did not want for us to continue the relationship because she didn't want us to have any children and go through that kind of experience. And uh, she began to explain to me how this, the, the sun that was inside, whenever the weather, excuse me, whenever the weather changes, they are fearful that he might not make it. And uh, that's a painful and dreadful experience for their family in a way on them. And she does not want to have her daughter do that. She did not want to have, to have her daughter do that. And she, again, insisted that we not continue dating. So much so that within the week, she had uh, requested that her daughter move out, move back home, leave Tallahassee. She was in college. And, uh, you know, that was the end of our relationship. So, you know, heartbroken me, you know, I was left to explain that to family and friends who knew us as a couple, which was uh, another odd experience on top of the odd experience that, that I had encountered. And so, you know, that is uh, what I meant by a powerful testimony. Wow. Um, thank you for sharing. And thank your wife for letting you be transparent, because I think that that, um, that really is going to touch a lot of people. So for you, that was like a life altering, literally a life altering time in your life. Um, did that experience then shape and inform your relationships going forward? Like then did you start leading with, I have trait? Thank you for asking that because that allows me to, uh, to discuss the, the path that God put me on after that. Um, um, I had gotten, you know, I think we all reach a point where we're searching for our real purpose on this uh, earth. Uh, and uh, I was, I had hit that brick wall and I was brought up to pray. I was brought up in search. So I know where my source comes from, but in that, and I want to share this testimony as well, how to pray, because before this experience of me hitting that brick wall, I did the standard, you know, the Lord is our shepherd kind of prayer, you know, but in that moment, when I hit that brick wall, brick wall I wanted to get <laughs> real results from my prayer. So I began speaking out loud. And when, I, and when I started speaking out loud to the Lord, uh, I began to hear myself talking. And in taking audit and accounting of that, I started to get more precise in what I really wanted while I was calling on the Lord. And, uh, I, you know, I began to, without uh, bemoaning the point, uh, let's just say belief is not as strong as knowing, but believing what you know is stronger than both. And so I stood up from that prayer, believing that the Lord had given me my purpose, which was to find a solution for that encounter that I had gone through with that person. That's what the Lord told me in that prayer. And uh, when I began to do the whole, my homework, God, you know, God made us all. So he made me he know what I was going to do next in my mm -hmm. belief. Right. So my belief is to research and determine whether there's a, a business need for what this 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 thing is that this endeavor that God has put me on. 
And so in my research, I was on the CDC's website and all the other websites like it. And in my research, I found that, oh, well, there's a whole lot of problems here, you know, um, and uh, it doesn't. And, and I then understood how big and vast this mission and plan or, that God had put me on, because with having a hereditary trait, just stopping there with hereditary trait, this bleeds across you know, cultures and everything, you know, under the sun. And so you have to understand that hereditary means, you know, other traits like, uh, you know, cystic fibrosis, mm -hmm. Huntington's disease, you know, so both all entail having the trait for something first. And so if I start a business that uh, is going to involve what, you know, what I'm here for, I have to open it up to all these other things. And that means opening it up to everyone. Look at God. He's put me on a course to help everybody, you know? And so that's what happened. And so in, in conclusion, I created again, swaggerscan.com, the world's first dating slash gaming platform for those who value getting tested. And what that means is disclosing, validating, testing, knowing your status, not just for STDs, but for hereditary traits like mine. So uh, again, swaggerscan.com, it's up now for all of the listeners to this, this show. Uh, please go to swaggerscan.com. It was made for you. Mm. Amen. Yes. Look at God. I got a wife and a business. I love it. So keep, keep us posted on that business. We'll be here to support that. Um, okay, I'm gonna bring Francine in, but before I do that, Barbara, I'm I'm I want to talk to you a little bit because Dia's story is really interesting to me because usually when I think about trade and like counseling, I think about a couple. Mm -hmm. In this case, it was the mother, it was the caretaker who was really adamant. And so say you get a couple and you get a mother, and the mother is like, mm-mm. I don't support this at all. What do you say in that room? Yeah, that's um, that's a really tricky one. Um, and I think it you have to acknowledge in some cultures <laughs> the role of big mama, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> big mama's going to have some control over stuff. That being said, um, I would say typically what would happen is to allow that mom her space to you know express how she's feeling like grandma will say you know her space to to express how she's feeling but if it's really a clinical situation and they're in front of me at some point i'm probably going to ask that mom to leave the room and talk mm -hmm. to this couple because in the end it's this couple's decision mm -hmm. and you go back to that making a decision that's not coerced that's informed for this couple that would what is best for them now they may decide what's best for me is for me to have my mom's 100 percent support and if that's what it is then mom doesn't need to leave the room because then you know that's that couple saying no you know her her word here is is you know critical to our decision making so i think it's really a, in, in that situation it would really be about um trying to tease apart is this mom kind of over exerting herself into this relationship, which mm -hmm. is then a whole nother thing? Or is this something that this couple, you know, is welcoming and wants? And, you know, did, did the mom force herself into this appointment or did they welcome her to say, no, we want you here? Right. Because I've seen all of it. Um, and so you, and Can so I, I would say, just real quickly, asking her to leave at least allows that couple the chance to voice how they really feel. Right. Definitely. Can I just piggyback here with another question? Um, from my perspective, we're educating in schools all the time. We're educating young people. Mm -hmm. We're educating athletes. So genetic counseling is what is the threshold for young people? I mean, because they trust me, they know about a lot. Mm -hmm. So do we avoid what happens if we are genetically counseling them way early? Or is that even possible? Is you know what's what is? Um, and I'm I'm thinking about our parents. I'm thinking about our young athletes, our our, our young students. 
mm-hmm. when can they start learning this mm-hmm. so that that you know mom's situation could possibly even be avoided right i mean i'm thinking we're doing sex ed in school i right. think this should be part of that conversation of just starting them to start to connect those dots mm-hmm. of you know, when I have a child, it comes with all these huge responsibilities, right? But it's also I'm passing down my genetic information. And you're learning at this time, you're in science class at the same time. You know, sometimes it's just about helping them connect those dots about what all that means. And having, I think it's, I, I think it's very reasonable to have this conversation around the same time that you're having that, you know, the sex ed courses. Because, and because, you know, they're coming in at 13, 14, 16, 17, already pregnant. So, yeah. you know, you don't want to wait for that. And again, for um, that, for it to happen and them not really understand. But the, you know, the challenge that you get is just the maturity of the teenage brain or the maturity of the 11 or 12 year old brain, you know, like you have to acknowledge that they aren't an adult. And so sometimes their ability to make decisions or to understand the, um, impact of a decision that they make today, you know, to 20 years down the road, sometimes this, the maturity isn't there, but I don't think there's anything wrong with, with trying at all. Right. So, Tiana, I really want to jump in with that, um, yeah. specifically since um, I knew since I was little that I had sickle cell. Um, that whole sex ed um, biology, that obviously got lost on me. Um, <laughs> and while now being a mother, and having three children and, you know, trying to educate my, my children about, well, well now they're all, they're young adults, but tr- from they were old enough to understand, I tried to make sure that I educated them um, because in a small way, yeah. I felt like I, I was blindsided. Um, I wasn't really prepared um, because even though I, I knew biologically speaking, um, trait plus trait equals disease, mature maturity wise that was mm-hmm. so what like, doesn't what does that mean it doesn't click. um yeah. i also had um, a friend in high school mm-hmm. who had sickle cell disease still lost on me um my cousin um first wife passed away from complications from sickle cell disease still lost on me so and and i like to consider myself as a very educated an intellectual person, but as a child, as a teenager, none of that really meant anything. Plus to add to that, it wasn't discussed in my household. Right. So, you know, parent wise, um, family wise, community wise, I had the information, which now as an adult, I know what to do with, but as a child, as a teenager, mm-hmm none of that really, really meant anything, especially since it wasn't like um, sickle cell disease, at least when I was growing up, was never really something that was discussed. Like it's really being discussed more yeah. now, um, but you know, back in the eighties, back in the nineties, nobody talked about it. Mm-hmm. And well, I I to, you said that, oh, go ahead, yeah. Well, I wanted to chime in because God brought me to this point uh, and uh, I'm here for a reason. And I think that I bring something different to the table because of what we're speaking of. I worked at the high school level for the last four years and uh, fortunate that God placed me in a situation to be around, you know, black people in an all black high school. So they were very receptive of the knowledge that I came with. All the kids now follow me on Instagram. Most of my followers on Instagram are from that high school. But I wanted to say this and that while we're having the sex ed uh, conversation and uh, those outlets, um, they're just that, they're outlets for those who choose to go down that path for most Mm -hmm. of the time. Uh, We have to back that up, us, us. We have to back it up with, if not creating cool alternatives for that age, those age groups, supporting cool alternatives for that age group. So I I do ask that everyone listening support my platform in that respect, because what I'm doing with my content is not typical of that of a a normal dating site. I'm informing and I'm, I'm, I'm doing what they call uh, putting the medicine inside the candy. 
So when you land on my platform, you're going to see pretty faces or you're going to see a joke or you're going to see something that you have to understand that what I'm doing, because I, I create my content, is attracting the bees to the honey. And so once they get on the inside of that honeycomb, they walk away learning something and they're going to walk away impressed that they learned something when they weren't even there to learn anything. So, again, we have to create more um cool alternatives for the generations that precede us so that they have more than they're backed up with reinforcement of what they what they may learn in the uh in the uh sex ed classes so th that's what i just wanted to add great i'm glad that you said that we definitely have to um change up the approach to be able to keep up with this generation and um really do better so i want to bring brenda back in um Brenda, so I know Brayden, that's your son. And I literally, when I met him, I was like, God, if I have a son like Brayden, <laughs> I'd be doing good. Like, he is the sweetest kid. So I want to just say that because the, the way I'm about to ask this question might come off a little bit sensitive. But I just want to ask you, like, we talked about the importance of shared decision making. We've also talked about options, right? So if you had been in the room with a Barbara, a genetic counselor, um, before conception, would that have changed anything for you? You know, I've asked myself a lot of times, um, and I know it depends, even depends on how much I knew about the disease at that time, once informed that that was a possibility. But I do know that I think on the other end of it, if I went ahead and we still had Brayden as he is, mm -hmm. um, that initial devastation part, the part of not knowing, mm -hmm. I think that would have been gone away because I would have been able, my thing was, I was unable to make an informed decision. Right. I didn't have all the information beforehand to walk in and, I mean, it was total shock. And so you know, even through our nonprofit, that's what we tell people, you know, at least um, know where you are. Cause I guarantee you, like Francine had mentioned about this, you know, not talking about it in the family. Mm -hmm. All of my people have been tested to find out, okay, who has the trait, who has C, um, we've had all the genetic testing, all of the kids, you know, just so that we know and we can be informed and we can talk to our children and let them know that it is important Having trait is important. There are a lot of things you need to know um, so that even them going forward and how they go throughout life. But yeah, I've asked myself that question. Um, I can't, I I don't even want to imagine my life without Brayden. Yeah. You know, and I've told people he made he's made me a better person. I am a better person because oh, you see, you hear me getting choked up. <laughs> imagine my life without my baby. So, you know, and I have to interject like that is, is such a difficult question. And I deal with, you know, families that have children with Down syndrome and children with Down with sickle cell and, you know, many different conditions. And I think, you know, when we talk, particularly in this preconception and prenatal testing arena, you know, I just, again, I have to emphasize like decisions are so personal. And we also need to be careful about um, how we, uh, just kind of how we think about people who are different, who just yeah. operate different, or their bodies operate different, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and that diversity, that's what makes the humankind beautiful, right? If we all sitting around here the same, that is not, <laughs> you know, that's not what we're striving for. And I'm not necessarily saying that we need to aim to have people born with sickle cell disease, but I'm just saying that we need to it, kind of, at the, and, and I'll say, because some of the conversations I have with some of my medical colleagues is like, you know, I don't see why this person just doesn't do IVF. I don't see why this person just, you know, doesn't have any kids. And it's just, it's not that simple. There's so much more to life. There's so much more to a person than what they have at the HBB gene, right? <laughs> so, you know, again, 
but people are going to put different levels of importance on that. And that's fine because you got to find what works for you. And for Dia, he found out what worked for him, right? right. Or that, that mama was like, this is, and that was based on her experience. She had lost children with sickle cell. Like that, how that impacts you is just, it's so, it, it's just so important. But again, I just, the, the point I want to make is just to be careful about, um, um, or just devaluing people who are born with a disability. You don't, you really want to avoid doing that. Um, I'm so glad that you said that. I have gotten into many a heated debates over <laughs> this. Um, people feeling like they can kind of size me up into that diagnosis and like, oh, how irresponsible that your mom did mm-hmm. this. this and and um, you know, a lot of people know my story. Like I literally had a bone marrow transplant to try to cure this disease, but I'm amazing. And Francis' right. children are amazing. And Brenda, I told y'all, Raiden is amazing. And so I'm I'm really glad that she said that. And like you say, like it doesn't mean that I'm gonna tell everybody with trait to go make babies with sickle cell. <laughs> but I want people to make an informed decision. And then hopefully as advocates and as leaders, we can do what we need to do to give people the resources that they need yes. so that that child has the best quality of life yes. possible. So Dr. Tamir, we run out of time. You got any questions that you want to ask the panel? Oh, you muted. Do have uh, my question is about symptomology. Though those you are trait warriors, uh, Brenda, Dia, Francine. Have you experienced any symptoms or what you would classify as symptoms? Um, and you can answer your question. Most of us have answered the other question, which is about the importance of advocacy. Uh, but um, we what we have four minutes to spare. Uh, so whoever wants to go first, if you if you are symptomatic and don't mind sharing, please tell us about it. I'll um, jump in with that. Uh, I from I was little had aches and pains, and it's so funny that you mentioned in your presentation. If you're in your 40s and you're still having those same aches and pains in the same place, it is not grown pains. And I've been trying to tell people that for the longest time, I need to find a new physician because my physician is trying to gaslight me into thinking that it's it's arthritis or something else. Um, but when it gets cold, my legs cramp up so bad that I need narcotics and a heated blanket or else mm. I'm just not gonna make it. Um, sometimes I have um, my my right arm will just be cold for no reason. Like the rest of me is hot. It's 90 degrees outside and my right arm is cold. Circulation is fine, but it's cold. And you'll see me have um, like wow. uh, a sweater on just that one arm. So I knew from from I was growing up that, you know, whatever they were saying about um, sickle cell trait is asymptomatic could not have possibly been true. Mm. I'm just based on um, so I've always loved science. I, I, I grew up and, and became a scientist, but just based on that information and understanding of science alone, I was like, yeah, no, there's something wrong that um, that goes beyond what it is that they're saying. And, and lo and behold, as I grew up and, and read the literature, that, that it was not asymptomatic. Brenda, do you? No, I... Um... I don't have any symptoms. I have C. Um, the only thing that's slightly related because I do have a blood clotting disorder is everybody that has C in my family has a very low hemoglobin. So we have to watch that, especially uh, with blood donation. But outside of that, no noticeable symptom. And to clarify, you have the C trait. C, absolutely. Okay. Yep. Well, that leaves the lone male on the panel. So I have, I have an interesting uh, last few seconds here to discuss uh, what I'm going through. Uh, uh, I'm 50 years old and I have tried to take Viagra and Cialis. And because of this this condition, I can't, I mean, it. I feel like I'm about to die every time I take one of those things. So I haven't mm-hmm. been able to take that stuff. And uh, I've uh, sought out, you know, natural remedies so, you know, that may be something that other men with the trait experience as well. Mm-hmm. Wow. Thank you. Yeah, that's a that's a big wow. Thank you, um, each of you, for sharing. All of this is so important. Mm-hmm. This whole advocacy conversation. 
I mean, I, I just want to go take it to Oprah and say, put it on your network and broadcast it, right? <laughs> yeah. Everybody needs to hear this conversation we're having tonight. Yes. But yes. thank you, thank you for sharing um, um, about the symptomology. I'm an ally, and I just, I just believe all y'all. I just believe you, and I just want everybody else to be heard. I am, I've heard so many of your stories, and I still learn from from hearing the stories and I'm further empowered and inspired to, to continue to do the work that we're doing. And thank you so much, Tiana, for the opportunity. Of course, and this will be the first of many. And um, I mean, I'm the CEO of a CBR, so I can make an executive decision. We gonna go like five minutes over because um, I've been ending all of my round tables um, with a message of hope. And so we're gonna do this one a little bit differently because I want to let Brenda and Francine close us out. I think that a lot of us are part of that uh, Facebook group, Sickle Cell Mommies. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes I have to just completely unplug from it because it's heartbreaking. Uh, there's a lot of moms in there who are just like devastated, like Brenda was talking about with that initial diagnosis. And so I want Brenda and Francine to close us out, um, just kind of giving a message of hope to those mothers. Brenda, you go first. Okay, thank you. Um, a message of hope. Uh, every time, you know, from that moment when we found out my son had sickle cell disease and throughout his life, you know, every time I looked at him, whether it was after a hospital stay or some short sick visit or when he's just happy, I look at him and he's smiling. He doesn't hold any grudges. He doesn't blame anybody. It's no woe is me. And then I have to check myself and be like him. And so he is my motivation. He's my inspiration. He's the reason why I do what I do as far as advocacy. And I find my strength through him. I mean, and I tell a lot of people, if you don't know a sickle cell warrior, you meet you one. Um, because you will be constantly empowered, empowered, inspired by them. So there is hope. I'm um, being in this community. You hear what's going on. You get motivation from each other. You get the encouragement to continue on. You see the research. You hear about the research and you know there's hope. You believe in, well, I believe in the power of prayer and faith. And I hold on to that. And as long as I have, I have that in my son, I have hope and there is hope. Amen. Yeah. Hey man, that was perfect. Francine, yeah. what's your message? Yeah. I, I agree 100% with what Brenda said. Um, my two warriors, uh, my trait warrior, they are my everything. Um, everything that I, I do career-wise, advocacy-wise um, is because of them, it's for them. I, I can't imagine uh, what my life would have been like if they were not born with sickle cell. I tell my daughter all the time um, that she's my hero because I see them doing things that I could have never done. And today I'm like, I still can't imagine myself doing some of the things that they do in pain every single day. Just last week, I was asking my daughter, like, you mean you really have pain every day? Because it blows my mind that she's in pain every single day and she's just going through life um, like nothing. And so my word of hope is that, you know, God put each and every one of us here for a reason. I too also believe in the power of prayer um, and our warriors, he gave them to us for a reason and for a purpose. So don't beat yourself up. Don't guilt. Don't feel guilty about um, what you've created. Um, just know that God gave you your warrior because he knew that you could handle being the parent of a warrior and that you and your warrior together can do great things. That was perfect. Thank you. I um, I yeah. want to thank all of you for spending this time and um, being transparent with us. I feel very inspired and encouraged by all of you. And um, I don't know if all of y'all know yet. I don't know if I've told you, but you all will be speaking at my conference next year. So people get to see you again. <laughs> so with that, um, I think we're ready to close out. Dr. Tamia, you got any last words? 
Uh, congratulations on getting that conference scheduled. It is on the docket, so it's going to happen. Um, thank you all. Uh, I, I would be remiss to just not mention that As One Foundation is asonefoundation.org. We um, are just just elated to to support this population, support all of you warriors, caregivers, trait warriors, and um, I'm, I'm honored. I'm absolutely honored to to be in this space with you and, and look forward to what's to come 2024. Here we come. All right, that was perfect. So we'll see everybody a little bit later. Thanks for joining us. And thanks for all the folks on Instagram, I mean, Facebook. <laughs>